But it can be taken farther than that. Knowing this, that when it says He came into His own, we only have to realize that everything was His own. Everything. Everything good. Everything right. Everything pleasant and excellent and beautiful. Every breath breathed was His. Was His. Have you ever come to that? Just sat down and thought about this for a moment. You claim so many things for yourself, so many rights, so many privileges, and do you not realize that every breath you breathe is His? Every beat of your heart is His. He came unto His own, and His own did not receive Him. Then it goes on, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. Now, to receive Him. This seems almost, in the first chapter of John, that we've reached an impossibility. I mean, this almost seems like an absurdity. Because He starts out in, in verse 1 saying that this one who came is God, he was in the beginning with God. It says that all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, the very essence of life. And this life was the light of men. And now you're going to receive that? You are told to receive that? That's like trying to force the, all the oceans of the world into a thimble. Especially in the modern clichéic language of you need to receive Him into your heart. Or not just into the heart, into your heart of hearts. I'm sorry, I'm here to tell you tonight He won't fit. Now what is twisted about all this? Now young people, listen to me. Sometimes young people seek to be radical for radical sake. You want to be subculture, counterculture. You want to go wild. You want to rebel. You want to kick against the goads. Well, this is a good place to do it. Look what has been handed down to you. And then I hope tonight we'll expose the lie of it. What does it now mean to receive Jesus? To receive Him. Because it says here, but as many as received Him. What does that mean? And don't come to me with theology. I want to look at your theology through the practice. Let's go to any evangelistic meeting that's going on anywhere in America almost tonight. What will it mean to receive Jesus? Well, the preacher will stand up and he will tell several stories. Because you're young people, and of course you can't appreciate or love truth, so we have to entertain you. And then after gaining your trust and all those other things to manipulate your emotion, then something will be said of Jesus dying for you. Of course, you won't know what that means because it's not explained. You'll be told about your sin, but not much, because more important than having your sins taken away will be this. Jesus can give you everything your heart's ever desired. Is your heart broke? Come to Jesus. Do you want a new life? Come to Jesus. Would you like everything to change? Come to Jesus. Do you want the emptiness taken away? Come to Jesus. And then if you come, with the lights dimmed and your head bowed low, after raising your hand, if you come forward, how will you be told to receive Jesus? How many of you would like to receive Jesus tonight? Well then repeat this prayer after me. Now look what we've done! We have taken this magnificent exposition of John, all this glory, and reduced it down to if you want your life fixed, pray this prayer after me. And if you do it, you will be assured that He has come in. This is not at all evangelism. 
And it's not what John is speaking of. And it is the very reason by most young people your age have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof who confessed God but with their lives deny Him. Who are religious but unconverted, have no power over sin, no desire for godliness, and must be kept together in droves in your youth group by entertainment. Now let's look at this passage. What does it really mean? Well, first of all, you can't understand it unless you look at the one of whom he's speaking. Go with me for a moment. Hold your place and just go with me for a moment to the book of Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 15. I want you to look at the centrality of Christ. The sense in which we say that the universe is Christocentric. That everything revolves around Him. That it was the Father's good pleasure to do everything He's ever done through His Son and to exalt His Son and give His Son a name that is above every name. It is to understand that this universe was not built for you. It was built for Him. Everything for Him. It says in verse 16, For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth. By Him. Everything. Every star. Every grain of sand. Every drop of water melting off the glacier. It was created by Him. Every angel. Every being whose glory we cannot comprehend, and if we could comprehend, we could not describe with human language. Every creature in heaven was made for only one reason. For Him, the one you call Jesus. Do you see that? Everything. For Him. Visible and invisible. And not just minor creatures. Thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. Whatever in heaven and on earth that was granted authority, was granted authority under Him and for Him, for His glory, for His service, for His good pleasure. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. This is the one. What I want you to see tonight is that Christianity has somehow twisted all of this to make Christianity about you. Let me give you an example from modern day preaching. I've heard this so many times. A preacher will, will evangelize people by saying this. You've got a good life. You've got a wonderful life. You've got a wonderful wife and, and children and you have a nice home and a good job. You just lack one little thing. You need Jesus to make your life complete. That is as close to blasphemy as blasphemy can be. What you need to understand is that apart from Jesus Christ, everything you're in your life is absolutely absurd. Here in Colossians, when it says that all things were created by Him, it can also be translated, all things were created in Him. And what you need to see is that Christ is absolutely everything. And outside of Him, in the mind of God, there's nothing. Outside of Christ, everything is absurd and vain. Smoke and mirrors. Wrong! So when we talk about receiving Him, we're not talking about receiving a little helpmate. We're not talking about receiving a friend. We're not talking about you and Jesus got your own thing going. And we're not talking about someone who can be received by some incantation or tiny little prayer. What does it mean to receive Him? To receive Him. 
Now I want you to look. He came